I appreciate the two fine introductions that I've had to my sermon this morning, for Sister June's Bible lesson this morning, Brother Tony's sermon this morning. <laughs> I feel like those, are, those charged me so much and made me anticipate uh, speaking tonight so much that I feel like they were introductions and they exhorted me and, and uh, encouraged me about this truth that I've been preparing here from Isaiah 51. Amen. Uh, these words that we know fairly well, especially that, that final statement there in verse 11. There are several songs, I'm sure, from verse 11 that have been written over the years, redeemed to the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. Everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy. Sorrow and mourning will flee away. What a great truth. Now, we had a Bible lesson this morning upon that theme. It was very uh, encouraging and challenging. Uh, you're just drawn into uh, the uh, revelation of those things, uh, the things that were spoken, and the way our sister presented those, uh, this affirmed this good truth to us. And and uh, we, we were just drawn to it and, and wanted to participate with one another and with her. We, we almost took over the lesson time, didn't we, all of us, in a, because it was so edifying just to think about those things, the largeness, the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth of those things. Our sister stated in so many different ways about truth being revealed to us. It's not something that you just discover laying around under a tree somewhere buried under some ancient ruins, uh, uh, embedded in a, in, in, a, in a cave somewhere in a mountainous area or something, you know, like people find certain things or, or, the, or with the machinery, they drill down somewhere and, and they discover a deposit of it, you know. It's nothing like that. Not at all. It has to be revealed. And God has so designed the earth and the, its inhabitants that he might do that very thing that he might reveal truth. Now, Brother Tony's sermon this morning, he established very ably, with great zeal, a believer's devotion to this truth and the proclamation of it. And that a heart that loves the truth will not settle for anything else and, and, and will not speak about anything else, will not proclaim anything else but this truth that is contained in the gospel of Christ Jesus. We're not talking about the truth of human anatomy or the truth of economic theory, uh, the truth of financial management, uh, the truth of political uh, foundations and, 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 and how human beings need to conduct themselves and behave themselves in their relationships with one another so that we can all have plenty to eat and have shelter and clothing. That's not the truth we're talking about. Now, the world all around us is searching for that kind of truth, aren't they? Amen. Except, of course, we know that even in our good land, which I appreciate living in, they don't know truth. If they find something that they want to light on for a little bit as truth, They'll only stay there for a little while, and it's, and it's no time at all before they're compromising that. Yeah. They compromise it away. And, they, and, and, and they, they pride themselves on their ability to compromise, and they demand that everybody compromises. Well, <laughs> think about it now. <laughs> if you compromise, then you don't stand for anything, do you? Yeah. Eventually, you get to the place where you don't stand for anything, and everything is negotiable. You can trade away anything and everything. But if there's truth, which they don't, you know, they don't really believe in compromising everything. They, too, believe in some truth. It's just that they disagree with us about the truth. They don't believe it's revealed. They believe they have discovered it or their experts have uncovered it in some way. We've evolved to the point, you see where now we're the generation, we're the smart people who have come to the conclusion about the truth, huh? Now, even the prophets of old knew that truth came from God. That it was not the, the, the Jewish prophets, the Hebrew prophets, the only ones to whom God spoke, knew that these things have to be made known that there's no power in us 
to obtain these things ourselves, to go up into heaven or to go down into the depths of the earth and find the truth and bring it up or bring it down. It must be revealed. It must be made known. And so this is why Isaiah says what he says. Awake, awake, put on strength, O Lord. See, the prophet appeals to God. To, now, it, 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 the, these words remind us that, and I was, I was looking at several texts like this this morning during our discussion in Sister June's Bible class about truth, where there are times where God hides himself. There are times when God does not speak, and Brother Given has pointed this out in his lessons from Genesis. There are sometimes huge, vast areas of time where God does not speak. And so it's like some draw the conclusions, and it's written here in Scripture. It's right here in Scripture. God's not watching. He, he's not paying attention. The Psalms. Psalmists write that, that the wicked say that. He's not looking. He's not paying attention. He doesn't know. You know, as we might say in our modern vernacular, you know, he's off busy doing something else. He hasn't. Or, or something like what Peter says, where is the promise of his coming? See? God's not doing anything. <laughs> Everything goes on just like it is. Well, now, those with faith know That God has called the people to himself for fellowship with himself in the truth that he is revealing. And, of course, it's truth whose foundation, whose root is in him. It's not in things. It's not abstract. It's not in some ancient book somewhere, so to speak. It's in him. It's of his own nature. It's his righteousness, see. It's his wisdom. It's his truth. So when the prophet says, awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord, he's entering into fellowship with God, knowing, knowing that it's only a matter of time before God awakes, so to speak, for, as far as what we, we might see it that way. But the reality is, even before the Apostle Paul stated it, God works all things together. Yeah, Job knew this, and even Job's friends knew some aspect of it, although you remember the Lord said, you've not spoken to me what is right like my servant Job has. So Job knew more than they did of how God works in these things. Job knew that all of this was in God's hand. And so he appealed to God then, let me, I want to speak to God about this, so that I can understand. This is, it's tearing me apart. It's breaking me down in a sense. You know, it, it, was, it was a great burden to him, and he wanted to. He found no help in his friends, did he? Miserable comforters are you all. And so he appealed to God about this matter. See? And God was pleased with that. God said, that's, that's right. I am in control. Amen. This did come from me. All such things come from God. When the enemy acts against God's people, which is, you know, the, the, the prophets knew that God would allow enemies to come in. He would allow them to do their work. Mostly <laughs> because of the rebellion of his people. Not all the time, of course. No. Jacob and his sons had not rebelled against God. God sent Jacob down to Egypt, didn't he? He sent Joseph down there. It wasn't because of Joseph's rebellion. He sent Joseph down there first to prepare the way. When Joseph was in place with, so to speak, all authority and power in Egypt, <laughs> then he sent Jacob and he says, go down to Egypt. Joseph shall close your eyes. And while there then, they were taken into bondage. So not, not everything happens because... But in the case of Isaiah's generation, it, it was happening. 
his generation was degenerating as far as their godliness was concerned, and they were heading toward an inevitable time of judgment. And he spoke about it. My people don't know. He says, the animals, your animals know where their manger is, where their food is, but you don't know that I'm the most high. Come let us reason together, he says. And, of course, they were not willing. This generation was the ones who said to Isaiah, you remember this, I cite it just every once in a while, it seems like, speak no more to us of the Holy One of Israel, prophesy to us illusions. They wanted that. That's what they wanted to hear, see. And so this is, there's, there's a sense in which this is, the, the prophet was appealing to God against his own people who had rejected the knowledge of God, his own generation who was rejecting God's truth. They refused to retain the knowledge of God. This generation did, see. And so the prophet was saying, awake, awake, O arm of the Lord. Act. Do something. That's right. Do That's right. something. See. And so God acts. Now, he, he doesn't act to destroy completely, of course. In fact, later Isaiah would say, As new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, Destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servant's sake, that I may not destroy them all. Yeah. He would awake and he would act. He would not destroy them all. He would leave what we know he called a remnant. Yeah. Yeah. He would leave a few. Remember that? Yeah. You remember that object lesson in Ezekiel? Mm. Cut your hair and take it and throw most of it to the wind. Burn some of it in the fire, but take some, a small portion, and roll it up in the hem of your robe and sew it and keep it. Mm -hmm. See? Amen. Yeah. Again, Jeremiah said from Ezekiel's generation, I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations, whether I have scattered thee, yet I will not make a full end of you, but will correct you in measure and will not leave you altogether unpunished. So this is the way that God dealt with his people Amen. down through the generations. The prophets would say, Lord, how long? Shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? How long shall they utter and speak hard things and all the workers of iniquity boast themselves? The prophet Habakkuk said, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry? And thou wilt not hear, even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity, cause me to behold grievance for spoiling and violence are before me? There are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore, the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass it about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. Almost the same words as Sister June mentioned that text this morning from Isaiah 59. Yeah. Truth has fallen in the streets. Amen. There's no one. Later in Isaiah 63, it says, I, 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 There was no one. There was no one to intervene, so my own arm. Brought salvation. Yeah. See, it's the, it's the arm of the Lord. And so the prophet knew that he could say, Awake and put on strength, O arm of the Lord. He could appeal to God. He could enter in to what he knew was God's will to intervene at the appointed time. See, God has established this whole thing where he can be glorified, where he can show himself strong and wise, where he can show himself faithful, in all of these things, we've talked about it several times. There are vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. All of this is from the Lord. Yeah. And so he himself has established this circumstance. All, the, all circumstances are under God's control, under his power. He works in all of these things so that we would have these words, so that we would know that we can lean upon the arm of the Lord. That's the title of my message this evening. <laughs> lean upon the arm of the Lord, that we can trust, because it's true. Part of, the, part of the definition of the biblical word truth is something that's solid. It's immovable. We, we use that phrase many times this morning. 
immovable, which is what the arm of the Lord is, isn't it? It's solid. You can depend upon it. No one's going to shake his arm out of place, you know. He is immovable. When he acts, who will turn him aside? Amen. Who will question God? Effectively, that is. Some may attempt to question, but it won't be effectively. <laughs> it's just so any questions like this that are raised about God, his strength, his wisdom, his understanding, his righteousness, are only so that he can show himself such. Amen. As such, he can, he can then display that he is, even though some reject even though some scoff, even though some doubt and reject what's already been made known, especially in this day of the sunrise from on high. So, Jeremiah then said, Righteous art thou, O Lord. When I plead with thee, yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Where doth the way of the wicked, wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? This is the question about when are you going to do something, God? Please do something. God allowed Jeremiah to ask this question in faith, knowing that he was going to act. It was only a matter of time. Yes. He was, even at that moment, preparing his armies to act. Of course, it was going to be against Jerusalem. It was going to be the Babylonian army who would come in. And after he removes himself, then, as Ezekiel saw in the vision in Ezekiel 9, after God removed his presence from the temple, there was no protection. And the enemy came in like a flood. That was God's, see, that was God's, react, that was God's action against these things, showing himself strong, wise, and faithful to his promises that he'd made centuries before. If you do this, I will then do this. And so he's showing himself strong. The prophets knew these things. They knew these things. So God directs the course of human events and places and people for his purpose. The prophets, Daniel, Nehemiah. Remember both of their prayers? Especially Daniel's prayer there in Daniel chapter 9. Asking God, knowing what God had promised through Jeremiah about the 70 years and that the time was approaching, what did he do? He started getting himself in line. And joining his hand, so to speak, joining his hand to the arm of the Lord. Leaning upon God's arm, oh Lord, show yourself wise and strong in judgment. Mm -hmm. Remove the enemies and establish your people not for our sake, but for your sake, because we are your people. See, the prophets understood this connection that God had with his people and the choice that he had made in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so they spoke of these things. Now the brutish man knoweth not, neither does the fool understand this, that when the wicked spring is grass and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they may be destroyed forever. He, like Pharaoh, he just raises them up so he can knock them down. Yeah. And they cooperate, you see. They, they don't know. They're blinded. They're like a beast. They're like a brute. <laughs> and they enjoy their time in the sun, don't they? When, Mary, when, when Moses walked into Pharaoh's court that day <laughs> and announced what he announced, you can imagine the scoffing heard from the back of the room. They're the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. And Pharaoh voiced their reaction. <laughs> Incredulous, I'm sure. Who, who are you? There might have been someone there from 40 years earlier who remembered Moses. We don't know that it was the same Pharaoh. Likely wasn't. He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? Yeah. He that formed the eye, shall he not see? He that chasteneth the heathen, shall he not correct? He that teacheth man knowledge, shall he not know? The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. Amen. 
So he directs all of these things to an appointment with his judgment. And that's what the prophet is appealing for. Awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old, art thou not that it, art thou, art thou not, art thou not it that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? Now this word Rahab is a, is a figure for rebellion and pride. It's not a proper name. Wherever it raises its head in human rebellion and rejection of God's truth, it's Rahab, see. And, of course, we know, don't we, who the dragon is, wounded the dragon, see. He divideth the sea with his power, and by his understanding he smiteth the proud, Job said that. He smiteth the proud. Same word as Rahab. The Egyptians shall help in vain. These are words of Isaiah, chapter 30. Because some of the people in Jerusalem thought, well, we can go get help from Egypt. But for the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. Therefore I have cried concerning this. Their strength is to sit still. The word strength is the same word that's translated Rahab in our text. It, that's all they can do is just sit still, stay in the same place, maintain their status. That's all they can do in their pride and in their rebellion against God. So now Israel, the people of Israel had a record And an interpretation of his meaning. That's what the prophets were doing. They were interpreting the meaning of these things. Remember some months ago as we went through Psalm 105, 106, and 107. Those expository psalms of the history of Israel. See, the scripture interpreted the scripture. <laughs> Tells us what it means. And the prophet here says, as in the ancient days and the generation of old. They knew the record of how God had worked. This has to do with his name, his reputation. Like, like Ray, uh, uh, um, oh, the woman in Jericho. What was her name? Ra Pardon? Rahab. In Jericho. She had heard about the working of God, hadn't she? From 40 years before, she remembered this. It's, it's unlikely that she was 40 years old because she later married and had children. But she'd heard and she'd believed these things about the Lord, his name, his renown, his reputation, what he had worked. Now, Sihon and Og, they had heard as well, hadn't they? But they didn't believe. And they were swallowed up. Rahab believed, and what happened with Rahab? <laughs> she was taken into the nation of Israel. She was spared. She was blessed, and not only was she taken into the nation, she was accounted in the genealogy of our Lord. Yeah. One of two who were not Hebrews, who were not of Israel, because she had believed. So the people of Israel rejected, for the most part, rejected what God had said. Even, even though they would brag about these things, they would reject his purpose for them in it, of his working and his redemption and his mercy and his kindness and his goodness upon them. Art thou not it which hath dried the sea, the waters of the great deep, that hath made the depths of the sea a way for the ransom to pass over. Well, we know what that's speaking about. That's the Red Sea, isn't it? And you might even say the Jordan River. When Joshua and his generation, the second generation, passed through the Jordan River, he made the, he made the waters a path for the ransomed to pass over. This is the way that God would. And they knew this, but they rejected it. And that's why that they were judged so severely. That's why this prophet is speaking about their judgment in such a severe way. The prophet Habakkuk, just before Isaiah, 
spoke about this. The prophet Jeremiah and the prophet Ezekiel spoke about this judgment. Judgment begins with the household of God, doesn't it? <laughs> but those who lean upon the arm of the Lord, they are justified. He brings them through on dry ground. They make it through the flood. They make it through. And the prophet Habakkuk's prayer is answered, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known in wrath, remember mercy. And so God does, see. He remembers mercy even in his wrath. His power is over all. I've made the earth, the man, the beast, they're upon the ground by my great power. By my outstretched arm, I've given it to whom it seemed meet unto me. Sennacherib, Nebuchadnezzar, he gave it to whom he pleased. Cyrus, he named him a hundred years before he was born. He was named by this prophet. You remember back here in chapter 43 or 44, 45, he was named a hundred years before he was born. My servant Cyrus, who was not in line to be on the throne and who didn't fight to gain the throne himself, God raised him up. And his people installed him on the throne, though he had no ambition. He was a military man. He had no ambition to be a politician, to be king. But he was installed. Why? <laughs> because it was an appointment from heaven. That's why. And God is able to turn people's hearts where he wants them to turn, see. His power is over all. Pharaoh, Syria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, uh, they're, this is the prophet who says, they're dust on the scales. They hardly, they hardly tip the balance in the scheme of God's working. Now, he uses them, and he works in them and through them, but they, they're, not, they're not the ones who are tipping the balance. God said that Sennacherib was a weapon in his hand. Now, Sennacherib thought it was his own power, and so he stood outside the gates of Jerusalem and said, Who can save you now? <laughs> who saved the other people I've destroyed? Nobody. You think your God's going to save you? Well, he wasn't talking that way the next morning, was he? No. No, he wasn't. And he said, certainly wasn't that way when his own sons put him to death in his own house or in the house of his God. I guess it was in the house of his God when he was worshiping his God, wasn't he? So, redemption comes to God's own. That's what the prophet says here. The redeemed of the Lord shall return. And, and not everybody's redeemed of the Lord, are they? It's only, we know that it's only those who mix these things that God has revealed with faith. They're the only ones who are redeemed. Those who don't mix these things with faith, what they hear from God, if they don't mix it with faith, then they don't partake of the redemption of God. For without faith, it's impossible to please God. Amen. They don't get the reward if they don't believe. The psalmist says, Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. Thou didst cleave the foundation and the flood. Thou driest up mighty rivers. See, nothing stands in the way of God's will. He uses these things. He works in these things that men have no power over. He can just cleave them and push them aside. Amen. And those whom he has chosen walk through on dry land. Yes. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. And we know that generation that came out of Egypt, they sang. Miriam led them in singing right, yes. after God's redemption there. But this is another time and place. They return to Zion. They hadn't left Zion yet, though, in Isaiah's day. It would be another century before they would leave Zion in rubble, in ruin. They would leave Zion and go to Babylon. And there they would be taunted to sing the songs of Zion, wouldn't they? But God had made an appointment, see. 
before it came to pass, before Jerusalem was even destroyed, God had made an appointment. The prophet wrote it down and sent it in a letter to Babylon. I know the plans I have for you, he said. <laughs> Seventy years and you shall return. And the prophet speaks about it here. One hundred years before Jeremiah wrote that letter, approximately. The prophet speaks about it here. And everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy. Sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Now we all know how they, how they liberated themselves from Babylon, don't we? No, they didn't liberate themselves from Babylon. <laughs> they were liberated by the word of God that he had spoken through this prophet 100 years before Cyrus was born. Cyrus was the one who wrote the decree granting them by that word permission to return to Zion. And they returned. So it was not of works, by works of righteousness, was it? No, yeah. Not then, mm -hmm. not now. Amen. Those who partake of these things do so because they lean upon the arm of the Lord. Amen. His strength. Because by his arm, he provides salvation, doesn't he? His own arm brings salvation to him. Amen. And of course, if you're joined to him then, you get because God is a giver. He's generous. He, 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 he engages us to partake of his good things. And so if you're with him, if you're his, what we know of as called, chosen, and faithful, <laughs> then you will participate. You will get to eat and drink at that table. Yeah. That he himself provides. redeemed of the Lord experience his kindness he extends his word and he works with his arm to extract a people from a condemned earth to extract a people for his own possession he did it in this generation he did it in Jeremiah's generation he's bringing forth a whole generation now isn't he of those who are born from above. Yeah. A whole generation. He is yeah. brought forth by his own arm. Now it didn't look like. By appearances. We talked about that this morning didn't we. By, by the way things appeared. It didn't look like. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Didn't look that way. So that the enemies of the Savior could say. <laughs> Let God save him. If he wants him. Let him come down and take him from the cross. Yeah. See it didn't look that way did it. That the arm of the Lord was at work. Mm -hmm. But we know because of the words of our brother Paul. That the foolishness of God is wiser. Mm -hmm. Than the wisdom of men. Yes, amen. And that the weakness of God. You remember he's crucified in weakness. Yeah. That the weakness of God is stronger than the strength of men. We know that. Yeah. Yeah. So God can bear his arm and men won't even know it. Yeah. They won't even know. He keeps himself covered with a cloud. Now, there's no darkness in him. But he can cover himself with a cloud until he is ready to reveal himself. And he has. In the things that we have believed, God has revealed himself. In the preaching of this message that the Apostle Paul said there in the text Brother Tony preached from this morning, that he delivered, faithfully delivered, in a manner so that their minds would not be distracted by the manner in which he delivered it, but they would simply hear the message straight forward. They would hear the message and believe it. Now, there were some among them who sought for something else, it appears. There were some who, there in Corinth, who maybe wanted to hear illusions. And, of course, Paul didn't deal in illusions, so they were looking for something else or they were trying to deliver something else, and so the Apostle Paul then had to write for the protection of those who love the truth, who had received the love of the truth. He had to write, and maybe some would be shaken. Some would be awakened. 
Some would be awakened out of their lethargy and their distraction so that they could see clearly these things and the working of the arm of the Lord and how he spares his own as a man does his own son and makes them jewels in his crown. We just sang that this morning, didn't we? In closing, then, here are some statements, some other statements from the psalm in particular. Now, there are many, there are many statements in Scripture about the arm of the Lord, his working with his arm. Here are some particular ones that I uh, am attracted to. They got not the land in possession by their own sword, neither did their own arm save them, but thy right hand and thine arm and the light of thy countenance because thou hadst a favor unto them because of God's grace. Thou hast thine arm, thou hast with thine arm redeemed thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. Thou hast broken Rahab in pieces as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. That's Egypt coming up to the Red Sea, saying, now we've got them. They're pinned between us and the deep Red Sea. But the Lord intervened with his right arm, didn't he? And nobody, nobody passed that fire. Nobody passed that pillar of fire in the night. From either side, right. everybody stayed away from it. See, when God, when God bared his strong arm, because thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy hand and high is thy right hand. With whom, speaking of David, with whom my hand shall be established, mine arm also shall be strengthened, shall strengthen him. Sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. That's almost a parallel to verse 11 here, isn't it? And finally, speaking of bringing them out of Egypt, with a strong hand, with a stretched out arm, yeah. his mercy endureth forever. Yeah. Now, brethren, his mercy yet endures in fact, his mercy's gotten larger from our perspective. It's always been there. But it's gotten even more larger. It's gotten clearer for us to see in this gospel that's been made known to us. How God extended his arm when there was no one else. There was none other to act. God searched. There was no one. Like there was no one to stand in the gap in Ezekiel's day. And so God had to stand up for his own name, for his name's sake, not for them, but for his name's sake, because they had blasphemed his name among the nations. And so he acted, well, now, especially now because of his own dear son, his mercy endures. And we can lean upon that mercy, lean upon his arm, and have confidence, the confidence of faith that has been once for all delivered to us in this message of the gospel, this working of God in his son Christ Jesus in that day to open up this day for us to believe and to come in response to the call of God. Thank you, brethren. God's grace and peace. Uh, Brother Jason has our exhortation this evening.